Welcome to the podcast. This is Cool Story Bro. What's going on? I'm Walt. I'm here with my co-host, Krista. Cool Story Bro. The cool thing about this show is we dive deeper into the music business to kind of take a look at what's going on behind the scenes, all the many different things that come together to create what we hear on the radio or on your speakers and your phone or whatever it is. There's a lot of stuff, whether it's shows or uh, people putting together videos or whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world of the music business. And that's what we kind of look at here on the show, on the podcast, Cool Story Bro. And we're here joined today by Frankie Sin from Atlanta. Dude, welcome. Good to hang hey, with you. How's it going, man? I'm going well, man. It's going real good. Good. How's Atlanta? Um, Atlanta's beautiful right now. The last month we had a ton of rain. Uh, <laughs> so oh. it's just, it's been like Seattle out here for like a month. <laughs> and now the now the sun's finally coming out the parties are popping again it's my favorite time go. absolutely so tell us how do we go from we're promoting we're political activists and now we're a musician take us through that journey with you man so both of those things have been in my blood since i was a kid my dad was very um pro black activist marched a lot stuff like that but he was also in the music industry, too. So my dad um, used to run a music studio. My dad has videos of him with, on tour with, like, Pac and Biggie as a roadie. And, wow. uh, yeah, and he's got, he, you know, the studio that he that he owned in Stone Mountain, Georgia, um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, is where Akon recorded Locked Up. Like, just all kinds of, you know, he, so I've been in the music industry since I was a kid. He used to bring me to the studio and I would test the mic. So he'd be like, just rap your favorite verse by like Eminem or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so he could test the microphone. So like, I've been doing this and I, I became in, I threw my first party when I was, you know, 15 years old, touched my first thousand dollars at a party. And I was like, yo, I'm going to do this forever. Yeah. And then. After I graduated high school, I got really into activism. So I would go to parties and I would talk activist stuff at parties because to me, especially the rave scene, which I didn't get into until a little later. But to me, the rave scene was an act of political activism, you know, free parties in the UK back in the 80s as dance protests. You know what I mean? So to me, those two things have always been, uh, you know, uh, left and right hand. That's awesome. Uh, so you did get into the rave scene in Atlanta, though. What what pulled you into that? So I, you know, like I said, I started throwing, uh, you know, hip hop parties in high school up until I was maybe like 21, 22. And I had a friend that I won't name. She uh, uh, helped me move at some point. I was uh, I was moving and I needed help moving and because I didn't have a car at the time. So my friend was like, hey, my homegirl has a car. She'll help you move your stuff. And so, you know, I was offering to pay her. And uh, she was like, no, don't pay me like, but I need help flyering this party. And, you know, you're a promoter. And I was like, oh, OK, cool. So I just thought, you know, it was just like a regular club night and it happened to be a rave. Um, and I was like, yo, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. Like I didn't I I have not turned back to the hip hop scene since. And that was 2010. So this was so when we talk about raves, I mean, because. All right. So I went to a few of those in the 90s. I actually, yeah. actually went to one. Um, my A and R guy took us to a rave inside the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Oh, I mean, fire. I mean, it was it was incredible. I'm like, you had no idea that there's the catacomb catacombs inside this bridge, and it was amazing. Um, but they're usually events you don't see them like in the newspaper or anything like that. You have to kind of know who's putting it on, get the flyer. Maybe you go to this address, then another address to pick up the right. actual that point. Yeah. Right. So is that the kind of thing that's going on that, that you were pulled into? No. Well, I, I did end up there, but that's not where it started. I got I got into the race scene at a very, very weird time in Atlanta culture where like Atlanta club culture and rave culture were like becoming one. So in 2010, you had like a lot of guys coming from other scenes that were like getting into electronic music. And those people were plugged in at nightclubs, you know, so you had, uh, you know, legendary quad nightclub here in Atlanta. Um, that, you know, my mentor and business partner, MJ Lee, um, you know, he helped throw some of the biggest shows there. Like he was the first guy to bring Skrillex to Atlanta, you know, so he taught me a lot about, you know, how to how to really navigate the scene, find who's next and things like that. And so, you know, I came in at a time where like all those guys who were throwing underground parties were starting to get plugged in at nightclubs and was like, we want to bring this music to nightclubs. You know what I mean? So the atmosphere early on before, you know, became like very 
I'm not going to say mainstream now because it's still not mainstream. People talk about the EDM bubble bursting and it's not even blown up yet. But <laughs> it was definitely still that super underground vibe, but in nightclubs, you know. Right. So it um it definitely uh it definitely still had that energy, you know. So what it's I like mean? it's a slight evolution from when you were doing underground warehouse parties that no right. no knew about to now you're into these clubs that. People still might not frequent the clubs normally, but now they're right. putting on a night and people can come. Right. Yeah, I totally yeah, get it. Exactly. You know, and then so when I got into it and, you know, I started learning from the elder ravers about these warehouse parties, I was like, well, shit, I want to throw those. So yeah. then we, so then in my mentor that I mentioned to you, MJ, we we got together with a, another partner of mine who I won't mention because he's not in the industry anymore. Um, he, uh, and we threw this party called kingdom rave and it was a kingdom hearts themed rave. And we threw it in a warehouse. Uh, police came and shut it down at like 2 AM. There was 2000 people there. It was the biggest party I had thrown at that point in my life. Um, and the police came and shut it down at two. We kept partying inside until 8 AM with no music. And I was like, this is what a party is supposed to be. And we just started, we started throwing those bi-monthly for about two years at one point. Kingdom Rave was the biggest independent electronic music party on the East Coast of the United States. So we were doing six, seven thousand people every eight to 12 weeks for like two years. Was it all in Atlanta or was it all around the Eastern Coast? It was all around Atlanta. So, you yeah. know, we had different different venues in Atlanta. Um, so one when, of you, which, oh, so when the cops shut it down at 2, 2 a.m. and you guys kept going until eight without music. Yeah. What, what did you what, what did you do to entertain They're yourself? Playing checkers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, games, Good, wholesome, clean fun. Right, wholesome, clean fun. Yeah, nothing, nothing. Uh, but to to be honest, um, there 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 was a point where there was about a six hour drum circle going. Um, yeah, and, and the cops didn't have a problem with that. No, because it was noise complaints. That's why they shut it down. Right, noise complaints from a rival venue, which will not be named. Ah, oh, so that's what it really was. Uh, the game's what, dirty. The game's crux, dirty. Man. <laughs> damn damn very so, much so. Uh, so now so now moving along how did you go from being throwing these parties like this and 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 kingdom hearts now you're a musician now you're an artist yourself how did that transition happen so we took a break there was a uh there was like a cascading like like a sequence of events um with the kingdom right thing first uh we got a cease and desist from disney we actually won which not many people can say because it's a parody event. It's not. That's it's not amazing, dude. The hearts party, high five, right? High, yeah, virtual no, high five. Can't do it, but Frank Sin can. <laughs> we also did a Rick and Morty party, and they got a cease and desist, and we beat them too. And they actually, Adult Swim showed up with a truck, so that was cool. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> you can't ask for a better promotion than that. No, right, right. They were like, we actually like this. Hold on, but uh, so yeah, so. You know, but it, it one thing about parties is one thing that one of my other mentors always taught me is that, uh, you know, uh, being a promoter is like Vegas. You know, you 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 lose seven, you win three. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's um, unless you get bought out by a major festival, um, you don't really you know, it's not it doesn't go forever. You know, right. so um, that and then so we you know, we we part ways. Um, but then, <clears throat> excuse me. But then after, you know, I started doing a lot of uh, local shows. I don't, I don't know if you guys are f familiar with DJ Pierre, but he um, pretty much invented Acid House. Um, okay. And I started working with him. He had a nightclub he owned here called um, called Wild Pitch. And so I was uh, helping him at his studio. We were throwing events there. We used to throw a party called Chop Shop that was really like um, into the underground rhythm scene before a lot of these bigger rhythm acts like Zuba, Drink Your Water, Permatrip uh, started, you know, blowing up and things like that. So I tried to keep close to the scene, but like, you know, I needed to live too. So I took a break for a while. Um, and in that break, like I said, I had always been in music since I was a kid, but I never really took it seriously. I just rapped for fun. Um, so when that, when that break happened around 2018, 2019, then uh that's when the uh, pandemic hits i was and, gonna ask how did that affect yeah. you yeah so at the time that the pandemic hit you know i took a break from throwing parties and became a production guy so i was you know working at festivals and things like that um just building stages and stuff just to get out of atlanta for a while and travel and i had the connections to be able to do it the pandemic happened all that shit got shut down i know the pandemic really like 
I mean, I mean, yeah, the music it, industry too. It it hit everyone pretty hard. Everybody took a hit at that time. I mean, like I remember playing my last show in Vegas in February of twenty nine uh, twenty twenty, and then next thing you know, like the world shut down the following two weeks later. And it was like, oh my god, now what do I do? So totally get it. No, and I remember feeling like I I feel silly about it now, but at the time when I was watching the news, seeing that Europe and Asia were all shutting down. I remember my partner, Brian, looked at me and was like, do you think that could happen here? And I said, in America? No way. That yeah. wouldn't happen. Like, that, that is happening in Italy. <laughs> it's happening in France. Like, literally, this global... I think that speaks very much to the American mindset, though, that we're so... Yeah, we're, un- like, we're untouched by the other, other yeah. world yeah, problems. Like, we're oh, protected. We're, that never happened to us. Yeah. And the air is different here. It doesn't allow for viruses to... Yeah, <laughs> right. obviously obviously not the case so like we all which is kind of interesting because then we all had a global moment where we were all kind of touched by the same thing and all affected yeah. the same way because you know this pandemic the disease the virus didn't know anything about nationality color race or anything right. so, exactly everybody yeah. get it yeah. <laughs> so um, all right so then but, so continue but, oh yeah yeah so so when that happened um my uh my manager, uh, Taylor Castro, um, we go back a long time. She's a very, very, uh, very tenured, uh, music, uh, music industry member. I mean, she's worked for, um, you know, Imagine Festival. She's worked for Shaky Beat. She's done work for iHeart. She's done work for, you know, just it goes, the list goes on. And she was just like, this is actually the perfect opportunity for you to like, make music, like do it for real. Because, um, you know, since I was working so much prior, I had actually built up quite a bit of that pandemic unemployment. So for a year, I had nothing to do but sit home and make music. So, you know, and at the time, you know, I'm I'm 30. Most people, especially when it comes to rappers, not so much when it comes to DJs and producers, but when it comes to rappers, once you start getting gray hair, the ageism really kicks in. They're like, you're too old to be rapping. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I start, uh, you know, I just start making a ton of music, shooting music videos in my backyard and, and then, you know, snowball effect just starts happening where people are actually paying attention. And then um, I, uh, you know, so I just started, I just started making all this music and I've already built all these connections in EDM. So I slowly started transitioning from just being a rapper to particularly rapping on EDM music. And I had a very, very uh, enlightening conversation with a friend of mine named Ian. He works uh, for the Grammy Society in Atlanta and he's, um, he's, a, he's a very, very good person. But he said, you know, man, um, there's a hundred thousand rappers in Atlanta, but there's not a hundred thousand rappers rapping on EDM in Atlanta. He was like, right. <laughs> I, was I, like I, I noticed it. I was listening to some of your stuff and that that's a lot of that came up where you're rapping on EDM stuff. I'm like, this is really different. This is cool. So, I mean, you have found a niche and I've yes. looked at your, your influences and they're varied. I mean, you've got rock influences and then the EDM with the Skrillex and all that. It's like, uh, it's cool. You can pull from all of these different places to create something that is uniquely you. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, and that's really the goal is because even in the rap scene, like there was only so much that I could do because my style is so like kind of experimental. And, but I was like, but I've already built a name for myself in the electronic music scene for the past year. Like, why would I neglect that? Like, that's where, that's where my people are. That's where my community is like. And so like, I just went full force and, you know, I'm just, I took the Lil Wayne approach. Like I'm, I'm giving everybody verses. Like I wasn't charging people for them. I'm just like, I just here, here's a verse, put it on your song, like put it out there. Song Smart. after song after song. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the money is going to come later. Like right now the art, like let's just do it. You know, how important is a vehicle like social media for you and promoting yourself? Um, Honestly, man, uh, social media is a gift and a curse. Um, A lot of yeah. people, get discouraged because you got you know the guys out there with 50,000 100,000 followers and stuff but the beautiful thing about it is if you got two you got 2,000 followers on social media and those 2,000 followers show up for you and like they're there for you then you know you can you can start to to make a wave and then you know I've also I've spent so much time like you know and I I left this out because it's not music industry related but I taught myself Facebook YouTube and Instagram ads um, because I was doing that as a side hustle for my like, local businesses. And but you know what? Wow. You know what? I, I, I I'll correct you because I do think it is music industry related. Oh, yeah. Because just just because of, like I know you've used it and I know in my band and and countless people who are promoting themselves on any of the social platforms, 
you have to have a little bit of savviness in order to cut through. And so Absolutely. if you are a new band, I would I would say that that's one of the first things that you should learn besides obviously your instrument and your your craft is to learn right. how to pro, pro, uh, promote yourself on these these platforms. No, 100%. And actually cuz I remember when back in the day when social not that social media wasn't ever big but for musicians specifically you started having people that would buy followers right that was yeah. like a trend <laughs> and, then, it. and then you would see their posts would get like five likes so like specifically <laughs> a group that had like fifty thousand followers on instagram right but when you would go to their shows they could only pull like well, you could and you can you could usually tell you can usually okay. see through that and go like all right this isn't real and and i think what you're right. saying <laughs> the way you're doing it is you can start with that two thousand but that's a real 2000 and right. that's going to catch fire with the, the right people who matter because they'll tell their friends. And these are real people who then come to the party. Right. Exactly. And that's, that's the goal that you want is community. Um, I know I name drop a lot, but it's because I've got so many like local influences that really helped me. But a friend of mine, Jamie Cornelia, she's a, a very, uh, she's a very, very popular um, independent rapper in Atlanta. Um, and she always preached to me about community. She was like, you know, you got people chasing numbers all day, but they have no community. So, you know, you got, they got uh, thousands of streams on social media, but then when they throw a show, there's nobody there, you know? So yeah. you have to, you have to actually build a connection with the people that listen to you. Um, and that is what's going to actually carry you. And then you have to build, you know, a connection with other artists as well, because, you know, like I said, that's what helped me out a lot. You know, um, I, what I do here in Atlanta, as far as music industry work right now, besides rap, is that I work for um, Iris Presents. They also put on Imagine Festival. Um, and so what I do is I'm, I'm a talent buyer there um, for their local and regional acts. So they, you know, they give me a calendar of headliners and I find, you know, the best local and regional talent to accompany those headliners when they come through. And so, you know, I get to I get to, you know, um, I get to speak to so many DJs of so many various sizes from all over the world all the time. And, you know, um, and now they know me as not only a booker, but as a musician as well. So, you know, right. I just had a, I had a release with uh, Heckler on Bass Rush um, back in February called In My Bag on his debut uh, LP. And, um, you know, like when that happened, you know, Bass Rush and Insomniac are such big names that, um, you know, now when headliners are coming through to Atlanta and they meet me as the guy that's booking their shows and they're like, you're the guy that did the song with, and now they want to do songs with me, you know? <laughs> so it's a snowball effect. That's how it grows. And then you, you, you get your name. I think what you said um, earlier about how you were, weren't charging people for verses, you were just tossing them out and here, let me contribute. You want me to contribute? I'd be happy to. I did the yeah. same thing when I, when I started doing remixes for people. It was just like, oh, yeah. I'll, I'm just going to do it for you for free. And then you you do enough of those. And then suddenly uh, your calendar starts to fill up and you're like, all right, so maybe I should start, you know, charging just right. a little bit. And then you build it from there. But I mean, like, it's a great way to start, a great way to get people to pay notice to who you are and, right. and to build a following. Right, exactly, exactly. And so like, you know, and then, you know, another another thing about, you know, being a, being a member of the team over at Iris Presents is that, you know, they... Right now, as far as I'm concerned in Atlanta, they're kind of like the hub for um, for electronic music. I mean, I could be a little biased, but, um, <laughs> you know, like as Nothing far as every that. every Friday and every Saturday, you know, they're bringing the absolute biggest acts in electronic music that can fit inside that venue on a weekly basis. And with that, um, you know, I was also far before I worked for them in the professional capacity. I was one of their talents. I was an MC, so I would host the night. And okay. so people know me for that here in Atlanta. So, you know, DJs will come in town and be like, hey, do you want to introduce me? Or, hey, do you you know want to MC over my set? And that, you know, that also it's a give and take because I can come up there and I can keep the crowd interested, you know, for them and keep the crowd hype for sure. them. But also my name is constantly out there. My face is constantly out there. Um, it keeps me fresh, you know. So I know you do a lot in, uh, in, in the rap world with your you know, vocal talents, but uh, do you ever do any of the music as well? Or is that you leave that to other producers? Um, so I can produce. I just hate doing it. Okay. Um, I do not have the patience to make a beat from beginning to end, much less mixing and mastering. Uh, I yeah. want to stare my face into a wall. Um, but there are some um, on my upcoming EP that um, that I'm doing. I have an EP coming out next month called Summer of Sin. 
Um, it's primarily produced by um, a, a DJ here named Stay True. Um, great talent. He's an incredible producer. But, um, you know, um, there's a couple of tracks where, like, you know, I'll I'll make like an intro and be like, can you build off of this? And, you know, so I use my I use my uh, my knowledge of production to, like, put things together that more talented producers can expound upon. There's there's nothing wrong with it. That's a great way to work. You know what your strength is, but you also have an idea. You hear something in your head and you try to work with that guy who can make it a reality and make it the best product that it can. I think that that's exactly. super solid. Exactly. Uh, you've got a new song that's dropping in a week, actually, right? Rest in Peace? Yeah, yeah on, Rest uh, in June Peace. 16th. Yeah. June Come, 16th, that. yeah. That song is uh, produced by um, uh, another great producer. His name is Rest in Pieces. Um, this is going to be one of our our first public experiments with the particular style of hip hop and EDM that we're doing um, that, you know, I'm, I'm doing particularly because it's not like rap and EDM haven't been married before. I mean, people rap, you know, on buildups of EDM songs all the time. It's been like that for decades. However, what we're trying to do here, what I'm trying to do with these producers here is create kind of a hip hop and EDM marriage to where you can't really tell the difference. Like when you hear the song, like if you listen to the first minute of the song, it sounds like a standard hip hop song, you know? But then as you get like halfway through the song, it begins to progress into an EDM song and then there's a drop and it's an EDM song. And so right. what I want is for yeah, people to listen. We had, uh, rivals come on the other day. And so we were asking them something similar. And I feel like a lot of artists right now are just defying boundaries of genres. They're not interested exactly. in having a genre. They're combining all of these elements. And so you're talking about, yeah, it's it's rap, it's hip hop, it's EDM, but it sounds like you don't really want to be defined by a genre at all. Yeah. I, I, a whole new thing. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I want. I want this. I want to make music that like you could play to a bunch of hip hop kids and 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 they would just be surprised by the EDM and surprised by how much they like it. Like the right. feeling that I got when I first heard I Can't Stop by Flux Pavilion back in 2010. Like, I like this. I never I would only listened to, to hip hop and, and some rock up until that point. And I went to my first rave and heard that song. And it literally changed my perspective on music. And I wanted to like do that for other people. You know? Dude, I love I love going to Lala and there's a stage there, Perry stage, which is all DJs and it's all EDM. And it is like it starts at noon and it goes until 11 o'clock at night. And it is 11 hours of a sea of drops, just yeah. right, build and drop, build and drop. And it never stops. Different artists, same. Th it's, and it's amazing. The place goes nuts for 11 hours. I, I, I totally understand the connection there and what a, what a great vibe, great energy there is in, in that scene. Exactly. You know, like I, I've been sending it to my I've been sending some of my unreleased stuff to like my friends that are tastemakers on the hip hop side. And they'll call me back and be like, what is this? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't even have a name for it yet. But it's rap and it's EDM. But it's not too rappy, but it's not too EDM. -y. It's like the it's it's the perfect I, I, balance I think, of both. I, I think that that's that's the challenge is finding that sweet spot right in the middle. Right. Where right. you can appease to, to both. You're not too too heavy on one side so you get the whole the whole crowd awesome. right right you also you also have another another ep coming in the fall the nightmare rave ep uh yeah with another producer right yeah his name is Linz Prague. he's one of the greatest producers i've ever met in my life he um this guy is so good that back in 2010 to 2012 or 2013 he was really huge in the electronic trap scene like when that when that sound was first starting to bubble. And then right at the peak, he quit to become a rapper, did a bunch of songs that went viral, um, played shows all over the United States, Canada, blah, blah, blah. And now he's coming back to EDM because he's like, I did everything I wanted to do in rap. I, I want to be a great EDM producer again. And I'm like, I fucking love you, dude. And so he's just <laughs> making, but since he is somebody who's had success on the EDM side and has success on the right rap side, when I explain to him what I'm trying to do as a producer, he gets it already, yeah. you know? So, so he already has the idea of like, when I explain to him the perfect mix of EDM and hip hop, he it's already in his brain because he's already done both at a high level for years. 
Right. So that, that it becomes a thing where he's like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do because I've done this. I've done that. Let's put it together. Right. You know what I mean? And so, so I have, I have the, the releases are conceptual. So, you know, the first EP that I'm dropping in July, which is, um, which is summer of sin. That's more of a, a, a lighthearted, um, really more mixtape style. Um, it's, it's a lot of heavy trap, um, dark trap and just like really fun lyrics about partying and stuff. Um, but then the nightmare rave is going to be the downside of that, you know, the hangovers, the, uh, the, yeah. the, the low serotonin, the depression, the having to use nightlife to escape, because honestly, that's what a lot of people found it for. You know, people want to escape from their Monday to Friday just to go out and have freedom for a few nights a week. And, you know, at first it's fun, but at, over time it can wear on you, you know, and, right. you know, I've lost so many friends to drug addiction and, you know, I've lost so many friends to suicide. And that just comes with, you know, constantly being in a state of intoxication like it's not always unicorn messages, dude. i mean like in the rock world you know I, I work at a rock station and so you know losing chester bennington of lincoln park chris cornell of soundgarden you know and the list goes on and on and on so i right. I, I know i i've been touched by you know the uh, uh the horror of, of nightlife addiction and uh the drugs and everything that can go through with that so it's like i yeah. think that's a super solid message to put out there. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it is fun, but you know, if, if you're not careful, then it won't be, you know, <laughs> right. I mean, simply said, but it's very accurate. Very true. Yeah. So, um, so, so what is the reason behind picking the different producers other than do they just schedules? Is it uh, who's right for whichever vision you have? Like you said, the darker vision, is that better for yeah. this guy? Yeah, it's it's more it's more the second one. It's more about the um, it's more about the feel of the projects. Um, you know, like I said, I grew up with my uh, with, with my dad, you know, teaching me hip hop. And one thing that I always liked about 80s rappers is that they would pick a producer for a project. And that would be that producer for almost the entire project, save maybe one or two songs. Because when that, that marriage between a rapper and a producer that have one vision throughout a project, as long right. as it doesn't become repetitive can be really fucking dope. So yeah. I kind of like that. And, you know, I switch produce, I want to switch producers just because, you know, of, you know, like it, it's a vibe, you know, so uh, stay true for the summer of sin EP. He's a very, um, he does between 120 to 130 BPM trap. So it's like very slow, heavy, like party headbang music. And then Lens Prague for the Nightmare Ray VP, he's more of a he's more of a Kanye. He likes the cinematography of the songs. And, you Got know it. what I mean? So that's more that's more suited for the message and the sadness that goes into that EP. Dude, I'm excited to hear this stuff, man. It's great. I'm uh yeah. Uh, I, the Nightmare Ravey EP sounds like it's going to be right up my alley. I'm going to really yeah. enjoy listening to that thing when it comes out. Yeah. And just, you know, yeah. the stuff that I've gone through in the past year, especially, um, it'll definitely be felt there. Just a lot of ag aggression and, and things of that nature. Give me uh, three records that define you. Ooh, just three? <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Wow. Um... Nirvana, never mind. Cliche, I know. Um, Lil Wayne, the Carter Two, and ah, uh, I can't pick a third because it's it's Kanye, but it's either 808s and Heartbreak or My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. Um, yeah, absolutely. 808s, man. Uh, it's, it's yeah. Amazing. They switch based on how I'm feeling. Like right now, the, the stuff that I'm going through in my personal life is my beautiful dark twisted fantasy for sure. Yeah. Um, but a month ago, it was 808s and heartbreak. You know, because <laughs> I it's went through a really big. It's funny how that goes. Yeah. You go, so Frankie, how you feeling today? 808s or <laughs> dead ass, bro. <laughs> yeah, I, get, I get it, dude. What's he, what do you got rest uh, planned for the rest of the year? Other than um, these releases, got, uh, uh, doing any shows? Um, I'm not I'm not I'm not lined up for too many shows right now because I want to get these um, I want to I want to make as much music as possible. Um, you know, I want to get these. I want it to be that by time this by this time next year, I'm in demand for shows, you know, so I am doing 
uh, some small shows um, that I can't speak on yet because they're not confirmed. I should be at Imagine Festival again this year. Um, but, um, and I'm probably going to do, um, some kind of, uh, album release party in Atlanta for the, uh, for the nightmare rave, uh, towards the end of the year. Um, but my main goal this year is music. And then I want to start lining up shows in 2024. Perfect. Love it, dude. I am so thrilled to have you on the show. It's cr- It's just great to talk. Cause I, I feel no matter what genre or whatever you're doing in the business, I think it's you got stories, you have something that I think we can all latch on to. And I just love talking to to new people, new friends like you. So thanks for so much for taking the time to be on the podcast today. Hey, no problem at all, man. Thanks for uh, reaching out to me, Krista. Thank you so much. You are amazing and you're a light in the industry for sure. Oh, thank you. I agree. Thanks, yeah. Frankie.